getting commuter benefits policies in place would be a really good thing because then companies would have to identify a commuter benefits manager, somebody that's tasked with caring about mobility inside that organization. They've got people that are tasked with sustainability. They've got people that are tasked with diversity or technology. Have somebody tasked with thinking about the commute. And I want to see more communities try that out. And I think there's a way to do it with a carrot instead of a stick, or instead of there being a penalty for not complying. There's some maybe economic development incentive that you get for offering commuter benefits. Hi, Smart Community Friends. In this episode of the Smart Community Podcast, I have a great conversation with Ryan McManus. Ryan is a mobility entrepreneur and the founder and CEO of Share Mobility, a technology company based in Columbus, Ohio, that helps organizations to solve complex transport problems with mobility as a service. I last spoke with Ryan in 2020, so it's been great to catch up on what he's been up to since then. Ryan begins by telling us about his background in mobility and current work in mobility as a service, what a smart community means to him, and we catch up on what Ryan has been up to since we last spoke in 2020. Ryan then tells us about the changes he has seen in the mobility as a service space due to the pandemic. He discusses the benefits of shared mobility and also how shared mobility can unlock the employment market. Ryan then takes us through the journey he has been on with his company, Share Mobility. We finish our chat discussing the emerging trends of companies offering commuter benefits and mandating commuter policies. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Hello, Ryan. How are you today? Hi Zoe, good to see you. So good to see you. It doesn't feel like that long ago that we spoke, but it also feels like a ridiculously long time as well. What's happened since then? Yeah, well, quite normal to see you on video. Yes, yes. I I mean, unbelievably these days, but we did meet in 2020 in person in Columbus, Ohio, which again, feels like a lifetime ago now. But yeah, enough about me. Let's talk about you. Tell us about your background and what you're passionate about. Great. Well, uh, thanks for having me on. My name is Ryan McManus. I'm the CEO and founder of Share Mobility. I'm based in Columbus, Ohio, and I am operating a mobility company that's specifically focused on getting companies, other companies, to help their employees commute better. And we built a mobility as a service business around this concept of smart commuting and the pandemic was a really interesting period for us as uh, you know, a lot of people ask the question of, is anyone going to share rides again? And we had to literally rebuild our entire business. So from the last time we talked, we were probably doing over, uh, transportation for a variety of different use cases. And we really narrowed in on one that we think is really high impact, but also has incredibly high demand right now. Yeah, uh, we were just having a look uh, to see when was the last time you came on the podcast. So we recorded just before the pandemic, and then that was released in March of 2020. And then we did a check-in on YouTube, so people can go and check that out, where we were actually, you were in the, yeah, basically it was happening as we were speaking, you're pivoting, we were in the pandemic, things were locking down, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, I'm keen to, I guess, let's go back there. And, you know, last time we spoke, you were just shifting and pivoting your business. So actually, no, first, before we go there, let's go broad because otherwise I'll forget. What is a smart community to you? So yeah, smart community or smart city isn't a term I uh, use day to day very often. Mm -hmm. And for me, as I think about smart communities, I define it as being very, very local. And I continue to see how it gets smaller and smaller down to like a smart neighborhood. And What I've realized is that there's like a lot of terminology that those of us working in smart cities or mobility use that for the general consumer or my customer, they don't 
understand it, nor do they necessarily care. And so a lot of the last year or two has been about redefining who we are and what we do so that it's easier to understand and that the value proposition is less about how I see the future and more about like, what is the real impact today? And I think smart cities is a, or smart communities is a really, really ambitious long-term vision that on a day-to-day basis can be very, very hard to see the change. But I can look back to what's happened in here in Columbus over the last five or six years since smart cities came about. And what I see is a lasting impact where there are, is started with greater awareness of what smart cities was or could be. And then it brought forward lots and lots of different problems. And it's been really cool to see how those different problems have gotten solved. And then solutions have been able to last far beyond any kind of you know initial seed funding that has came in. And now we're starting to see these smart programs have legs and be really like self-sustaining. Mm. I think that's a really good point. It's like solving real problems now, but then also thinking about problems in a different way and then bringing them, I like the idea of, you know, bringing it forward, bringing it to the table. So then we can actually look at solutions for those different problems. But then also that we were, you know, there was experimentation happening. There were, you know, we didn't know, not everything was going to get legs, right? But we learned a lot along the way. And as you say, you know, the initial seed funding is really important and gets things up and running, but the legacy or the, you know, the, the long-standing kind of, or I guess the approach that then can deem it successful is if we can then continue past that and that they can, because they're, they're valuable enough to be solving real problems that can be invested in, whether that's government or whether that's private sector solving, you know, there's all different problems, obviously, so many different that we can that we can tackle with this approach because there's so many things that are involved in it. But yeah, I think that's important to kind of go, well, if we're only talking about things that are way off in the future, then how do you really connect with the community and the clients and the people that you want to work with to solve problems now? So it is a bit of both. Well, it has to be. It right. has to be a bit of both. Yeah. You know, I think for people like us, we can get really excited about how innovative and futuristic some of this stuff is. And it seems like it's really not that far off. But I think for others that haven't had the same level of exposure, don't bring the kind of excitement to it. They could often roll their eyes at it. Like uh, that some people have real challenges on a day-to-day basis from whether it's childcare or affordable housing and the idea of Hyperloop can just seem so far off that you're not open to the stuff that could be really, really useful and helpful to you today. And it's been important for me specifically to not give up on kind of that academic or futuristic vision, but to figure out how to phrase it in a way that's going to be easier to understand. And what was cool about the pandemic is we figured out the one thing we need to say to companies and to get them to listen. And you know, as you think about like this future of mobility and all the things that all the great things that can happen from road safety to pollution reduction and time you're given back and cost savings, like if the business is the customer, none of that has real impact on their bottom line. But the pandemic has brought about this, this really global job shortage or employee shortage. And that's been the hook that's gotten companies to pay attention to mobility solutions and lean in because now they can see how it's going to actually help their business. And all of the other benefits that we do create don't necessarily matter as much to the decision makers that we found. And it's not that they don't care about them. It's that they're not the reason to buy. Yeah. And I guess like when you're thinking about offering a service, you need to, all those other things are great. It's like, I think about, you know, the, if you're doing a keynote speech, for example, when you're writing on your website, you're not writing for the people that in the audience, you will get ABCD. You're actually writing for the booker. So then their people will get ABCD. And so it's similar where you think about, you, you still get all those other great benefits and the people in the audience get all the great benefits, but actually you're writing the language of the booker or the language of 
the CEO. And it's so important because when you're, and it goes to the point that you mentioned earlier about people in the community not really connecting with smart city or, or even smart community or, or whatever that term, not shared mobility, you know, future mobility, smart mobility, because it's like, well, what is it for me? What's in it for me? And when I'm trying to juggle three jobs and, and childcare and food and all that kind of stuff, what's it going to, how is it going to impact me? So you actually have to learn to speak multiple languages to be able to then get the most benefit out of it. Yeah, you're totally right. And it's always been a challenge of this business is there's like multiple audiences that have different levels of awareness about what it is. So you have to almost make the story a, a little bit different for everybody. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think, yeah, that's a big challenge for any company, but also any you know person kind of trying to drive this smart community thing. You've got to work out what it is. What is that pain point for that person? And then how do you solve that? And yeah, you get these other benefits and they're awesome and you can talk about them later and you need to be aware of them um, because you might need those for a story for somebody else or, you know, the narrative for somebody else. Mm -hmm. I think that's, yeah, it's a really important one. And sometimes we may forget, like, why isn't this, you know, why is, why is this not landing with this person or, or this company or this bit, whatever, because we haven't quite found the right narrative for that person. Yeah, cool. I'm keen to, all I can think about is I want to know what have you been up to since the last time we spoke? So let's just keep it broad. So it was March 2020. I think we're right in the thick of it. I mean, we're still not post-pandemic, right? So um, right. we're living with it. But yeah, when you pivoted and, and changed, what were some of the things that were happening during that time? And then what's happened since? Yeah, I mean, mid-pandemic, we were trying a variety of different things to, one, just like keep the morale high and keep going. But also, like, we had no idea how long certain customers would be down, certain businesses, you know, we had no idea how long they would go. And so it was, it was a point at maybe towards the end of the summer of 2020, where you kind of just took an approach of like, this is the new world and you have to operate serving those who need it today. And don't think about anybody that might come back. Don't think about something maybe different that you might get into who could you serve today that really needs transportation. And so it was a look at who was still moving at the height of the pandemic, because we saw that as a segment that we could serve that would always need this. And they couldn't go to remote jobs and you physically had to go to an office. And that's when we started to talk to more and more manufacturing and logistics companies and so many of them were located far away from where their employees lived. And one of the common challenges that we saw with these companies was that they had just an enormous amount of open jobs. That was their biggest problem is that they had more, they just couldn't fill all of the jobs. And when you look at the number of people that live in the communities where the jobs are located, there's more jobs than there are people. And there's also often like a major difference in pay and income levels from the people that live in a community versus the type of job, you know, there could be entry level jobs out there where the workforce just doesn't exist. And so we kind of figured out how to unlock this hourly workforce by showing human resources departments specifically that transportation as an employee benefit was the key to filling their jobs. And we, the beginning of the pandemic, we're just in Ohio. We were operating in a fairly small geography. And over the last nine months or so, we've expanded into 11 out of the 50 states. And one of the reasons we were able to expand so rapidly is we figured out how to partner with different companies that operated transportation. And so in operating it yourself, you became a competitor of public transit and every other organization that was running it themselves. And so we developed this partnership program and we've started working primarily with private companies that have vehicles and drivers that can support us all across the country. And we also want to be working with public transit agencies because, you know, we've got companies to understand how they're already paying for the commute if somebody is paying for it after tax. We can help them do it for a whole lot less. We see an opportunity to help public transit agencies by having that money flow from the companies to the transit agencies who could be the operators and unlocking 
enterprise employers was the big success of the pandemic. And we just raised a series A investment that's allowing us to hire a whole bunch of people. So we're in the process of of creating about 75 jobs and starting to expand nationally with the customers we already have. Most of our customers operate between like four and 400 locations across the country where they need transportation. And our software is uh, in what allows us to go and replicate the transportation in all these different cities. And we're able to open up really, really quickly because when we meet a company and they have a need for employees, like they need us to, to be able to start really quickly. So the last six months or so have been about getting faster and being able to go into more and more rural areas. We operate in some of the most rural areas of the country, but there's a huge amount of people that otherwise wouldn't be able to get to the job. I think two thirds of our riders don't have public transit access to the job they're going to, and they don't have a car at home. Mm-hmm. And so it's become a absolute necessity for our customers and our riders. And what I'm trying to do now is get HR departments to understand that taking a role in your employee's commute is a really important benefit that has a uh, direct impact on the bottom line of the company, but it's, it's also really good for the employees because they're going to keep more of what they earn. And it's a huge competitive advantage in this really, really competitive job market that's not going away. And I think HR and human resources departments are the key to unlocking mobility. And I think I've found the pressure point that if we can get this change to happen, the shift to mobility and shared mobility can happen even faster because when somebody takes a job, they're buying a commute. And if that job requires them to own a car, they're signing up for five years of car ownership. But you know, people change jobs more frequently than they change cars. And if we can get into the new hire packet of companies and influence the decision people are making about how they're commuting when they're taking that job, I think we can accelerate the shift to shared mobility. And so being able to unlock companies has been a not good just for our growth, but I think it's the key to unlocking this market for mobility and making mobility as a service sustainable. Mm-hmm. Thanks so much for sharing that. Super interesting. And I think, you know, HR being the key to unlocking mobility is a great tagline, but also super real, but something we may not connect on a day-to-day basis. And I think also when you're talking about moving people to shared mobility and that it's a necessity, I think in, in a lot of locations and for a lot of people to actually access a job. And I think sometimes we forget about how imperative the commute is to a job that you need to physically be there. Like, I don't know, I, it seems a bit wild that sometimes we forget that we need to get to a place and that that has to be part of our just, dis- and it's part of everyone's decision making when even if they're taking a job that's sometimes remote, but sometimes going in, okay, well, where's my closest bus stop? How regular is it? How reliable is it? My car, how reliable is that? How much is that going to cost me? You know, am I just going to scrape through, but I need this job to build up my resume, all those type of things as well. Or can I live closer to my work? Oh, no, it's too expensive. Whatever the case is, there's so many different things that feed into that. Just for those who don't know, what's a day-to-day for somebody, I guess, the customer I'm keen to talk about, so the customer journey of, you know, when they're going to a job using shared but also from a, the company side, what are some of the benefits and things that they're talking about and how does that work for them? Yeah, so I'll take it from our riders' perspective. So our riders get introduced to share mobility by their employer most often when they're taking the job. And in most cases, it's they've seen in the job application that transportation is provided or share mobility is provided. And so the individual employee when they're getting set up with HR, they'll get invited to share mobility. And then they use our web-based booking app. There's nothing to download. And they get to see all of the bus stops that are the virtual bus stops that are provided by their employer. And those bus stops are all created dynamically based on where the employees live. And so they're seeing bus stops, but they're actually created because that's they're you know a quarter mile or less from where they live. 
and the employees will schedule their rides in advance. And in just a few minutes, they could book a month or more of round trip transportation. The times and the timetables of the pickups are all designed around when they need to arrive to work. And so the riders are you know, deciding when they need to arrive for their shift. And then that tells them their pickup time. They get text notifications when the vehicle's on its way. They're meeting at a stop close to where they live with a couple of other coworkers. And in most cases, they're just riding with their coworkers. And then they're arriving to work on time. They're taking the same vehicle home and getting dropped off. And they're also riding with their coworkers. And the, the stops might be different based on who's riding. The routes are all really dynamic. And then each company decides if they want to charge the riders fares. We're seeing more and more of our customers pay for the full cost of the fare. But when the employees do pay, we recommend 2 to $3 a ride. So there's parity with a bus pass. But there's not a single route we run where there's an optional bus route that you could take. All of our services are going a place that there is no public bus option for them. We wouldn't duplicate that and we're not creating this private bus service. And if the employees do pay, it comes out of their paycheck and it's deducted pre-tax, just like health insurance. And so, you know, like you said earlier, the commute's a very individual decision and everybody's got to figure out how to do it on their own. But we see huge benefits to human resources providing the option or providing the best option for their employees to commute. And one of the things that does is it increases the number of people that you can hire. In the United States, I don't know if it works this way in every part of the world, but uh, every job application starts with, do you have reliable transportation? And that's become like the acceptable discrimination question of, do you own a car? And so if you could replace that with here's transportation options, there's more people that can say yes to the job. It's really simple. Yeah. And and then also, like you said, you wouldn't put you on a car, but it's pushing that boundary as well to go, well, actually, that's not what we advocate for. We advocate for shared mobility because it's better for the environment. You know, it's better use of resources, all that type of stuff as well. And then also, yeah, you can hire more people in different locations based on how far the route is and all that kind of jazz as well. But also then people can, you know, it unlocks that. I'm not going to even apply for that job because I know that I need to answer that question. It's like, oh, if I have this offer, you know, it just, it allows them people to even apply for those, I don't know, different jobs based on where they know that they are or whatever, but they always, oh, no, I can't because I don't have a reliable option for transport or whatever, or this job is on the way when someone else can drop me off or whatever the case is. Whereas maybe that one, which is a better job, I would have to get a bus and a train and and ride a bike or whatever the case is, which is also their option if it works. But yeah, just opening up people's minds as well as unlocking the employment market too, I think is also really key. Mm -hmm. So thinking about shared mobility, Can you tell us a little bit about the journey that you've gone on? Like, obviously, it's a hard time during the pandemic and, you know, pivoted a bit. But what was your original vision for for your company? And then now, how has it shifted and changes? Or is it the same? You're just doing it in a different way? Well, you know, I, I think when we started Share, the vision was that mobility as a service would be a growing part of the automotive industry. More and more people would take trips in a vehicle that they don't own. The big shift that I've had is that I'm not trying to change someone's behavior anymore in getting them to give up a car to take a trip and share. And it's not that we don't have people that do that. It's that that's a much harder thing to do. And there's a lot of forces against that. And so why struggle when there are so many people today that just don't even have transportation? And so the the big shift is that we're focused on bringing mobility to people that have that don't have it today versus converting them. Mm. And I think that's really good for the overall automotive industry because we're bringing people into it that have been excluded from it. So the overall market size and the value of the market grows. And 
The choice to choose something other than a car you own for a majority of your trips will happen. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I know that there's a growing population of people today that can't afford the car and that cars are getting more and more expensive. They're harder to get. Fuel is incredibly expensive right now and probably won't be going down. And even with electrification and autonomy around the corner, those vehicles are going to be more and more expensive. And so they're going to be further and further out of reach of those who are getting their first job, those who need a second chance, those who earn the least. And I want to be able to help those, that part of the world, get into mobility. And uh, here in the United States, the path to do that, I think, is through the human resources department and talking more about what we can do as an employee benefit versus it being this new mobility solution has made all the difference. And it's helped people pay attention to it. I'm doing the same exact thing. We get people to schedule rides. They share them in a vehicle they don't own and the vehicle runs really efficiently. That's been the same, but positioning it as the human resources benefit that'll fill jobs is what's gotten us so much attention. And I think it's really aligned with my vision that someday companies are just going to tell their employees how to get to work or vice versa. The employees are going to say, how are you getting me to work? Mm -hmm. Like you said, you're still doing a similar thing, but the the shift is how you're doing it and what, I guess, the the outcome you're looking for and, and bringing mobility to people that don't have it now is obviously a brilliant vision to have, and but you're actually able to achieve that too because we're not focused on necessarily shifting. Like the mode shift is I can't get a job now or I can't access transport now and how can I do that? Because there's so many other things that play into people, whether that, why they own a car and why they don't, and um, will continue to shift and change. And I think even just getting, like you said, the shared mobility to be uh, an option and viable option, something that's not new and novel. It's just something that happens. You get more traction in that space. This is how these things happen. But you're not necessarily having to only you know, to talk about things that are completely outside of your control as well. And so I think that's really important. And I also think like it brings it into rural and regional areas as well. And even just using car less, but also having efficient use of resources too. And you know, as we move into electrification and automation, fleets are going to be can be the first ones because the opportunity there is is much more, I guess, viable. And like you said, the more expensive, but for fuel and all those type of things, you know, moving to electrification, but it's much easier or it's much, I guess, it makes more sense to electrify the whole fleet. Those type of things, you can see the the benefits, you can see the scale, you can see all those things. You can also influence where the charging device, you know, um, charging stations are, all those type of things as well. You can have that really kind of fleet approach. And I think we're going to see more and more of that as we move forward. But in the meantime, it's like using the best use of resources and bringing mobility to people that don't have it now. Yeah. I think fleets are getting left behind in this electrification shift. Mm -hmm. And as important as fleets are going to be, there isn't a pipeline of the next generation fleet vehicles that are being electrified And I'm really concerned about the supply shortages of lithium and batteries and the companies not planning to make as many vehicles as going that could be needed. I think that's something that needs to get more attention, which is the the need for a purpose-built mobility vehicle and the needs of fleets not really being met by the automakers yet. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. And a bit of work I'm doing at the moment is also that gap. Is interesting, like looking at those shared, be- you know, the kind of minivan type situation that aren't being that type of vehicle isn't being electrified. Which, well, I'm not seeing a you know significant push for electrification. Whereas deliveries, you know, like you said, on demand shared, it makes so much more sense. But there's some barrier that's happening. But also, yeah, the shortages of materials and all those type of things. We have to keep working and innovating in this space so then we can have sustainable solutions for this because it's not going to just be a, oh, this barrier is broken down, now we can go. There's so many other intricacies, right, and how that all feeds together. Yeah, it's incredibly Mm -hmm. regulated and it takes a very long time to bring new vehicle technology to market. And, uh, you know, hopefully there's some really good stuff in research and development, but I haven't seen it yet. Mm. Well, that's a good segue to future. 
because I think, you know, let's see what happens in the future in this space. And and then, like you said, hopefully there's lots of stuff happening behind the scenes that all of a sudden will emerge. But again, working in this space, we can start to shape and shift and, and drive these things by talking about it more and more and getting that attention. So what are some of the future trends that people aren't talking about enough? So, you know, I mentioned the, the perfect shared vehicles not really being made yet. And there's just an incredibly high cost for car ownership right now. One thing that I'm seeing in the U.S. is financing for vehicle repairs, that the cost of the vehicle repairs and the types of vehicles that we're trying to keep on the road and keep working are requiring such major repairs that financing for the repairs And I think this can be a huge debt burden on consumers that are already struggling to own these vehicles and to keep things that, you know, maybe shouldn't be on the road, still on the road. I'm really concerned about that. One thing that I'm starting to see a little bit more, because Philadelphia just passed a commuter benefits ordinance in the last few weeks, but I, I think there needs to be more talk about commuter benefits as a requirement in communities, especially communities that are trying to do things like corridors. And so the, I don't know, maybe just for the audience's benefit, a commuter benefits ordinance is a policy that a city or a municipality will take that requires companies of a certain size to introduce transportation benefits like bus passes, carpooling, bike benefits, and you know things like share mobility to their employees. And I think it's the thing that could help get my message into the HR departments through mandate. And just in the same way that uh, companies of a certain size are required to offer health benefits, companies of a certain size that offer transportation benefits would be a really great thing. In, in the US, 86% of companies don't offer any commuter benefit at all. And so one of the reasons is because they don't have an option. If we can help them create more options, then they're going to be able to do this. You can't force them to offer something if there's no bus option or or mobility option. But getting commuter benefits policies in place would be a really good thing because then companies would have to identify a commuter benefits manager, somebody that's tasked with caring about mobility inside that organization. They've got people that are tasked with sustainability. They've got people that are tasked with diversity or technology have somebody tasked with thinking about the commute. And I want to see more communities try that out. And I think there's a way to do it uh, with a carrot instead of a stick, or instead of there being a penalty for not complying. There's some maybe economic development incentive that you get for offering commuter benefits. Yeah, I think, like you said, it's so intertwined and com- not I mean complex, but just like the system of systems that communities are. And I think this policy and the regulation, all those things that are happening is all so connected. So it's like talking about this and then bringing it to people's attention. And like you said, I think with sustainability, when I went to university, we talked about sustainability, but it was still kind of like, oh, that was what the environmental people did or whatever. Whereas now what you, you you see in companies, it has to be somebody that's thinking about those things. And then things are changing and action is happening. And sometimes it's there's small incremental changes that lead to that massive action. A lot of the time that's the case. Otherwise, and again, even when we see these big changes, there's so many small things that have happened along the way as well. And so why not shifting that approach as we move forward into the commuting space as well? Because I do think it can really serve a population that is underserved now, as you mentioned, but also that it feeds into like, increasing ridership of you know public transport and active transport because it's a different way to do things because it's um you're not just jumping in your car going a to b it's actually getting you used to going to the virtual bus stop or whatever the case is but then you know getting that well-being aspect of it as well like you said commuting with other people chatting along the way or maybe you're just sitting there and listening to your podcast whatever the case is but it is about talking about it more and getting because, and I think our language, as we talked about earlier, is really important because our language ends up in our strategies and in our policies mm-hmm. and shapes our decision making. So, if we can start to talk about it in a different way and different solutions will be different for different communities, then we can start having those better, bigger conversations. And as part of our communities, it's not just the people, you know, the everyday people in them, it's those companies that exist in communities as well that really shape what those communities look like, too. So, 
bringing them into the conversation is really important. Yeah, absolutely. They, they generate a lot of the demand for the transportation that's that we have. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Ryan, it's been so great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me again. I really enjoyed hearing what you're up to and congratulations on the growth. And, you know, it's really exciting. And I, I often talk about, I shifted to smart communities because I wanted to talk to people that weren't just in the big cities, but also people that didn't have access to the network now and couldn't you know, any network and mobility, obviously my background is very close to my heart too. So love the work that you're doing and bring mobility to people that don't have access now. And yeah, it's been great to catch up. Thank you. It was so great to be um, able to share an update about what we're doing. Yeah. And I would really love to meet in 3D again sometime soon, somehow, somewhere. We'll have to work that out. Yeah. Maybe one of these global mobility conferences or something. We'll have to see each other in person. It would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thanks again for coming onto the podcast. One last question. How can people connect with you? I'm pretty easy to find on LinkedIn uh, or go to sharemobility.com. And if you fill out one of the forms, you can get in touch with us. We've got a bunch of jobs on our careers page right now. And we're looking for people that are really passionate about mobility or impacting their community. So we'd love to find really good people that could join our team. Absolutely. We'll put all the links in the show notes so people can click away and find you. Maybe even passionate people are looking for a good job as well. Thanks again, Ryan. And I look forward to our next conversation. Thanks, Zoe. Good to see you. Thanks. Bye. The Smart Community Podcast is brought to you by My Smart Community. If you're trying to deal with disruption, not sure what technologies to buy, need to facilitate genuine collaboration, then we can help. Email hello at mysmart.community or head to www.mysmart.community forward slash consulting. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes, so thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.